Hey everyone, let's talk about how uh, wheat and gluten can cause adrenal fatigue and low cortisol. Okay, so I gotta be honest, uh, adrenal fatigue I have a little problem with because the way most people use it and the way it's been kind of taught and uh, promoted over the last 20 years is uh, it's a problem because adrenal fatigue is a very amorphous, ill-defined concept. It became really popular, was kind of coined a little over 20 years ago. And since then, you've got labs doing uh, adrenal salivary tests telling you whether you've got adrenal fatigue. But the thing is, that as a concept has never been really defined. There is no definition of it. Uh, and it's certainly not a definition that's ever been validated. Now, I know I'm going to get a bunch of hate mail and hate comments about this, but adrenal fatigue, it doesn't really exist that way. The gland doesn't fatigue. Most of the time, the problem with the adrenal glands is a command problem. I'm going to show you a, a little graphic here in a second. I think that's going to explain that. So even though I used adrenal fatigue, uh, it oh, <laughs> kind of feels like a bait and switch, you know. Uh, but that being said, uh, wheat can cause problems with adrenal gland function. And I'll just go ahead and tell you, and it's going to do that through a process called cross-reaction, which I'm going to explain in just a second. And it's going to ultimately uh, can make you have low cortisol. So I want to get this adrenal fatigue thing out of the, out of the way at first. So let me just say a couple more things about that. Um, uh, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal circuit is the circuit we're talking about. And, you know, I guess I'll just go ahead and jump over here and show you normally what happens with those, okay? So come over here with me. Okay, so let me just explain how the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis or adrenal circuit works. So here in blue, we have the hypothalamus. It sends a signal to the pituitary gland that's called uh, CRH, or corticotropin releasing hormone. That tells the pituitary gland to make something called ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic hormone. What does that do? Well, that talks to the adrenal gland, the outer layer of the adrenal glands, and they then make the hormone called cortisol. Okay. Now, cortisol is very important. You have to have it. Uh, it's not really, I mean, you've learned about it as a stress hormone, but you need it every second of the day. Uh, it has a lot to do with blood sugar uh, regulation, turning your brain and your body on in the morning. It also helps uh, kind of activate and uh, also kind of regulate your immune system. And, and when you hear people talk about adrenal fatigue, what they think they're saying is that there's a problem with how the glands are making cortisol. But most quote unquote gland problems are really just command problems. There's a problem with how the hypothalamus and the pituitary are communicating with the adrenal glands. And unfortunately, as, as a concept that's been validated by good science, it just isn't there. More often, what we're talking about is what I call low HPA axis tone, which I guess we could talk about at another point. But the point is, is that adrenal fatigue, you know, that's not really a, a very a realistic, accurate model. But that being said, we're talking about wheat, right? How could wheat affect this whole circuit? How could wheat have anything to do with that? Well, if we go back over here, you know, we've got our kind of normal thing happening, right? And we've got this. Well, the, the enzyme that's in the adrenal glands that helps it make cortisol is something called 21-hydroxylase, okay? Now, in wheat causing this problem with low cortisol, what you can get are 21 hydroxylase antibodies. Now, these antibodies are made by the immune system. What they're going to do is they are going to stick on to 21 hydroxylase inside that adrenal gland. And what's going to happen is we're going to have a hard time making cortisol. So cortisol levels are going to fall. And when that does, then we can start to develop symptoms, which I'm going to cover in just a second. Okay. So this is the connection. The connection is, is that eating wheat can cause 21 hydroxylase antibodies. And that whole process is called cross reaction. So let me jump to another slide and I'm going to show you how that works. Okay. So in cross reaction, we have two things over here. We have thing A and thing A in this example is going to be wheat. Now to be specific, there's a part of wheat called alpha gliadin uh, that becomes something called alpha gliadin 33 myrrh. And I'll show you a slide on that in just a second. That's our thing A. Thing B 
is going to be 21 hydroxylase, again, which is inside the adrenal glands, helping us make cortisol. In cross reaction, the immune system makes antibodies for thing A, right? And as you can see, that antibody is going to stick to thing A, which is what it's supposed to do, okay? The problem is that same antibody for wheat, in our example, can stick to 21 hydroxylase. And that is a problem because now the immune system is going to go after both things. And it can be the primary reason that we start developing low cortisol. It can be a secondary reason working with other factors helping us make low cortisol. And that is the danger of cross-reaction is the fact that the antibodies for one thing can direct an attack on a second thing which is not the first thing, but they look so close, but they're kind of molecular mimics. They share a uh, amino acid homology that that can happen. Okay, now, so let me show you just real briefly what we're talking about in uh, wheat. Now, in wheat, or now I've titled this slide, you know, what is gluten? Let me just show you. So we've got wheat, right? But wheat is made up of several different uh, categories of substances. We've got the proteins. We've got non-gluten proteins. We've got lectins. Now, the, the famous lectin here is called wheat germaglutinin, which I'm not going to talk about today, but I've talked about in other videos. And then out of the proteins, we've got what we call, as an umbrella term, gluten. But that's made up of a couple different uh, categories itself. We've got exorphins, which I'm not going to worry about right now, uh, which can be important, especially in the context of autism. Uh, we've also got glutenin, and then we've got gliadin. Now, gliadin can, it's made up a couple different frac uh, fractions as well. We've got alpha gliadin, gamma gliadin, omega gliadin. Now in parentheses here, what are these numbers? Uh, these are representing the different sort of um, flavors or different uh, shades, different kind of fractions or isomers that these proteins can be broken down into. So like we've got alpha gliadin 17 mer, alpha gliadin 21 mer, which I know sounds weird, and alpha gliadin 33 mer. Now, Alpha gliadin 33 myrrh is what cross reacts uh, with the 21 hydroxylase. And just real briefly to finish this off, these different proteins are processed uh, by an enzyme called transglutaminase 2, uh, which can result in another thing called deaminated gliadin. And the point is, is that uh, wheat is not just like one monolithic thing, there's a bunch of stuff in it, and it's alpha gliadin 33 that is the known cross reactor. Uh, with uh, the 21 hydroxylase. And again, if we go back and we look at what normally is supposed to happen here, if you develop 21 hydroxylase antibodies, it's going to affect your ability to make cortisol. And with cross reaction, what happens is the antibodies for this wheat can cross react with 21 hydroxylase and produce low cortisol. Now, okay, so that's that's the groundwork. So that really is how eating wheat can create adrenal fatigue or adrenal fatigue symptoms and low cortisol through cross reaction. Now, when this gets really bad, we can call this Addison's disease or primary adrenal insufficiency. And and the problem is we have so little cortisol that we start to have a lot of serious symptoms from that, such as general malaise, fatigue, weakness, loss of appetite, weight loss nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, low blood pressure, low libido, loss of menstrual cycle. Now, if you asked someone, hey, what are the symptoms of adrenal fatigue? They might say some of that stuff. But real adrenal insufficiency, these things are very prominent, very serious, and it's because you have low cortisol. And so you probably got to get tested correctly for these. And I don't know if that's that's beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. But you can get checked for 21 hydroxylase antibodies. But you also have to get checked for is your HPA axis producing uh, the amount of cortisol that it should produce. And you can do that with an ACTH test and a serum cortisol test. So uh, make sure you're working with someone that understands all that. Please just don't do like an adrenal salivary test and uh, go with that. Um, 21 hydroxylase antibodies can uh, be present for several years before you develop like really overt symptoms. Um, so they can be predictive. So if you test them now and they're there, um, it's something to be thinking about. It's something to be, have uh, concern and, and to, to take action about. So what action would you take? Right? Like what's the take? Why am I even telling you all this stuff? Well, I wanted you to know 
Uh, one of the other ways, uh, one of the many ways that wheat and gluten can cause cross-reaction and affect a lot of different uh, systems and create a lot of different symptoms. The other thing I wanted you to know about is this idea of adrenal fatigue. And I, I know people mean well. I don't mean there's like, you know, a, a shady conspiracy to make people believe in something that doesn't exist. But as a, as a real good, hard scientific concept with merit, uh, adrenal fatigue as it's usually defined, which is poorly, just is not it. Uh, a better idea about that is HPA axis tone, where we're really acknowledging how does this circuit really work. Well, it's the hypothalamus and pituitary that are the major influence, unless you're having autoimmune destruction of the uh, adrenal gland, which is the other thing we're talking about today is how we can lead to that. So again, make sure you're working with someone who's current, who's up to date, and if you've got some of these symptoms that you see here as adrenal insufficiency symptoms, get checked and get checked the right way.